So let me review this with you a little bit. The lifetime of spiritual leadership. As you mature, the mentors get fewer. Fewer and fewer. One of the coolest things in my life, I, when I was at seminary 40 years ago, I remember them speaking reverently about a man called Wilbur Alexander. Never met him. I remember seminary teachers speaking in awe of this saintly faculty member who had just moved to Loma Linda before I got there, so I never met him. 35 years later, I assume the head of the table at the School of Religion at Loma Linda University, and at the other end of the table is Wilbur Alexander. He's now 91, sharp as a tech, hasn't lost anything, madly in love with God. I took one look at him and said, ha, mentor. <laughs> you, see, you never get too old for that. You always need somebody that, that has been down the path, goes along the road. We talk about stuff like this uh, all the time. As you mature, the mentors get fewer. Fortunately, at Loma Linda, people live a little longer, or so they say. So uh, you know, we got people doing surgery at 98. That's scary. But, uh, <laughs> number two, as you mature, the opportunities to mentor increase. And I think one of the primary purposes of our existence is if we're 60 years and beyond, and we have been walking on this journey, haven't been getting stuck and resisting, so if we're walking on this journey, Number one mission from here on is mentoring. Look for the younger guys and, and, and help them along the way. And you say, but what if they kill me? Okay, there's a way around that. <laughs> Come to that in a minute. Body slams. Body slams. <laughs> yeah. Number three, this needs to be a natural occurrence, not a program. I remember the first time I shared this material, I was, I was called, strangely enough, to, uh, to share uh, with a group of uh, Muslims. And I remember there was a gentleman sitting in the front, he was 85 years old, you know, wearing all the robes and the hat and everything. And he was watching me intently through the whole thing. And when it was done, he jumped up and he turned to everybody else, he said, I need to say something. This is the most dangerous teaching I have ever heard. But it's true. He says, just keep in mind, you don't grow yourself. You've got to let God grow you. Don't try to get to the end of the path. It's taken me decades to walk this journey. Don't try to jump to the end of the path. Let God grow you at his pace. That's good advice. Mm good advice. Every so often you find a kindred spirit in surprising places. Must be a natural occurrence, not a program. This is something God does. We can till the soil, we can water it, we can fertilize it. Mentor those who are at earlier stages. You've been there, you can help them. Learn from those at later stages. And if you're at the same stage as someone, you can nurture each other. Now let me say something here. There are people who enter the dark night and retreat, and we spoke negatively about that, because the retreat was out of self-interest, out of protecting themselves from pain and suffering and trouble. There was self, selfishness involved. The whole process of these stages of faith ultimately is wringing the selfishness out of our hearts. Stage three people are still riddled with selfishness. They don't know it. Every one of us in this room recognizes that challenge. If you read the spirit of prophecy deeply, you will see she's exercised about this at a very deep level. That pride and self gets mingled with everything. And God uses dark nights of the soul and difficulties and criticism, if we will, to wean the self out. But when, out of selfish motives, we go back to earlier stages, we get stuck. But there's another reason to go back, and that's for the sake of those you're mentoring. 
If you're mentoring someone at stage two and you come to them out of four, five, or six, you won't help them. They won't have a clue what you're talking about. They'll be scared to death. They might even try to harm you in some way, spiritually if not physically. If you're going to reach somebody in stage two, you have to meet them where they are. And that means going back to stage three and meeting them at that stage and helping them to grow from the stage where they are to the stage where they're going. So the way to survive when you're out of touch with the majority is to meet them where they are. If you're at stage four, five, or six, God has called you to stay with this church. God has called you to minister to these people. But you do that by meeting them where they are, which is what God did in Jesus Christ. So, I don't take that as a message. <laughs> but you see, God is calling us to meet the people just as he does, to go back and meet them where they are and help them to grow. Your job isn't to get them to stage six. Your job is, is to set the context in which God can grow them to the next stage they need to be. And not to be critical of stage one, two, or three and say, boy, you know, those are where they belong at the time that they're there. It's only when they get stuck that they no longer belong there. And then nurturing and encouraging them to create a context in which they can grow. That's the mission. So it's all about mentoring and discipleship. Stage six people, obviously, are mentored by God because there's nobody else. So if you want seven stages, there it is, is Christ-likeness, God-likeness would be. But stage six is pretty close to that as well, uh, the unconditional love of Christ. The Bible addresses all six stages. And this is very helpful to me. Have you ever read certain texts of the Bible and gotten nothing out of them, and then 20 years later, suddenly that text is the best thing you ever saw? Oh, yeah. You see, the Bible speaks to different stages. There are stage one texts, stage two, stage three, dark night of the soul texts, and so on. The parts of the Bible that will minister the most to you are the ones that you need right now. Sermon on the Mount, I think, is stage six, which is why most people don't quite get it. It, it, it's just a step beyond what we can imagine ourselves achieving at this stage. You see, so the Bible speaks to the different stages. Let me say one more thing about this. It's possible to be in more than one stage at a time. I think most of us tend to oscillate back and forth. We might be stage three one day, stage five another day. You know, as we're wrestling with God's call for us. So, uh, uh, that's one thing to keep in mind. One final thing. Institutions and faith. Hagberg points out, and I think she's right, that never in the history of the world has there been a religious institution that progressed past stage three. Now why would that be? Because institutions by their very nature are focused on preserving the institution, are focused on the money and the baptisms and so forth, the things that stage three focuses on. For an institution to go into a dark night of the soul would be the destruction of the institution. Now Hagberg theorizes, I don't know what to say about this, but Hagberg theorizes that it would be easier for an institution run by women to make it to stage four. Because women by nature are less enamored of stage three thinking and more enamored of self-assessment and, and relationships and so on. So I don't know. Uh, is there a denomination somewhere that's run by women? We'll see what they can do. But uh, anyway, just, just thinking about that. It, it makes sense to me that institutions of religion by nature tend to be focused on stage two or three simply because that's where most of the people are and inevitably almost will be. And I just wonder, this whole thing, when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, is that a suggestion that the final generation of Earth's history will be the first generation in history that will actually go through a dark night of the soul? We call it the time of trouble. 
and thereby the selfishness. You read what she says about the time of trouble and about how they're still riddled with doubts and, 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 and concerns and the sense of the, their own character is defiled and, and so on. They're still human. They're still struggling. But God is using the universal dark night of the soul to draw out from them an experience with him corporately that would not have been possible otherwise. Just a suggestion, just a thought. I think there's much more. We may want to wrestle with some of those things. But if you're one of those people that just feels like you don't really fit anymore, I don't want anyone raising hands, but a lot of people come to me privately. That's normal. It's what happens when God leads you. And you deal with that by seeking the good of those around you. And if there are two or three stages behind you, go minister where they are. You say, that's your mission now. That's your call. And if nobody acknowledges your mission and nobody promotes you and, and, and this and this and this goes on, it's actually the norm, not the exception. And for me, that enables me to, to see the call and the reach of God even in the dark times, even in the hard times of our experience. So that's what I came to share. Anyone have a question? It's 11 o'clock, that was my goal. Why don't we take about 10 minutes? And then what I'd like to do is share with you a few clips from the evangelistic series, share with you some of the materials, and uh, let you know of uh, an alternative that has been quite successful in Australia a place that's extremely secular. And, uh, so we'll share that with you in the last hour. Gathering, let me just put some resources here. Um, if you're interested, uh, John Pauline, Facebook, if you just Google that, you'll get my public Facebook page. I'm not into Facebook that much. But my webmaster encouraged me that it's a tremendous way to, to uh, leverage your ministry online in ways that you didn't dream of. Uh, the benefit from going there is I'm doing two things right now. One of them is the first in the history of the world Facebook commentary on the book of Revelation. So what I'm doing is going through Revelation verse by verse and posting one paragraph a day. And when I'm done with that verse, I go to the next verse. You see? And uh, I don't think anybody's tried that before. Facebook is only out there about six years. But if you go there every day, I won't be here for some reason. Global Linda's encryption won't let me get the email here. Uh, you know, internet in this hotel for some reason. Uh, maybe they can help me fix it this afternoon. But. I probably won't be posting today or tomorrow for that reason, but uh, generally every day I post a paragraph. And when I'm done, I'll uh, have 2,000 pages or something, maybe, maybe publish a commentary. But uh, Facebook commentary, and then people react, and we go back and forth, and that teaches me some things too, so it's a neat experience. I'm also doing a Twitter commentary on Revelation, and that is I summarize that paragraph in 140 characters or less every day and put that out there. So for people who like the really short version, and yeah, you know, I don't know what that'll end up. If you publish a book, the Twitter commentary on Revelation, you know, all these sentences, I don't know. Uh, we're also at the School of Religion doing a study of Ministry of Healing as sort of the founding document for Loma Linda University. And we're studying it chapter by chapter and I'm posting summaries of those chapter discussions. I think we just finished chapter 21 out of 43. Also, I'm posting on Twitter a uh, statement each day out of Ministry of Healing with the page where I got it from. Just a, just a succinct Twitter-like statement, a really, really cool statement. So uh, I started that about a year ago, and I'm about two-thirds of the way through Ministry of Healing. So there's a number of things going on on the Facebook page. You can go to the Twitter, too, if you want, and uh, uh, 
Uh, I try not to clutter it with garbage. Occasionally we'll show a few pictures of a family vacation or something. But generally this is serious stuff. Uh, my website is www.thebattleofarmageddon. As one word, I was shocked out of my wits to discover that that was available. <laughs> so thebattleofarmageddon.com and uh, oh, I think we don't want to lose that projector here. Uh, thebattleofarmageddon.com if you go there uh, you'll find a daily devotional every day there's a fresh devotional there's a blog and right now I'm blogging on spiritual formation that's a bit of a controversy in the Adventist church I'm sharing my own experiences in the seminary with, quote, spiritual formation. What it is at the seminary, what it is in other places, why it's, a, you know, why it's a problem to some people, why it maybe shouldn't be a problem in other ways. And uh, uh, so uh, sharing some thoughts on that. So there's a blog there. And one reason I mentioned this is uh, if you're interested in some of my books, but they're no longer available, I've written more than 20 books, and most of them are out of print, uh, there's a download there where you can get all the books. I think it's $15 or something. I don't make any money on it, but just uh, uh, for the maintenance of the site and stuff, there's a download that has all the books, and you can go through them electronically. So uh, that's kind of like 17 books for $15. So, Somebody mentioned, I, I mentioned a book, and he says, where can I get it? I said, well, that's where you can get it. So just, a, just resources there. Uh, won't cost you anything unless you do the download. So, all right. Uh, want to share with you a new resource for evangelism. Uh, for many, many years, students of mine have said, you know, your material on Revelation, boy, that should be evangelistic. You need to do an evangelistic series and teach us how to do that. Well, my response was always, I'm not an evangelist. I can do it, but I don't think I'll ever be good at it. You know, I, I'm not gifted in that particular regard, nor am I trained in that regard. So I said, if you will take the material and use it and shape it, I'll be happy to endorse it, and you know, then we have it. Uh, well, for years and years, uh, many students said they would and never did. And finally, one of them, who happened to be 10 years older than me, uh, finally got excited about it and did it. And his name is Graham Bradford. And he teaches evangelism at Avondale College uh, in Australia. And so we set out on this project about nine years ago. And imagine it, a Bible scholar and an evangelist bantering over scripture. Unheard of, you know, very, very different. Uh, evangelists, are focused on what works. Scholars are focused on what's true. Uh, the two often <laughs> come together. <laughs> I can tell you they were knocked down, drag out battles when they didn't. <laughs> he says, but you've got to say it this way. And I said, but that's not where the text is. You've got to stay faithful to the, But the people need to hear this at this time. And okay, we battle it out, and after a couple hours, we'd come to a compromise where we both could live with it. And it was, it was just a neat process. Anyway, um, so there are materials that have been created, four color materials, and uh, they, uh, these are handouts that you can give to people at the meetings. And it's a wonderful incentive, because if they come every night, they get a new one every night. And they're developing their own you know, complete resource in the book of Revelation. There's co you know, colorful <coughs> pictures from archaeology and uh, from contemporary life and so forth. And the whole idea was to do something that would be faithful to scripture, but would be really interesting and exciting to contemporary people. Uh, if you can kind of keep them together, why don't I just let those circulate around? So these are the things that you would actually hand out to the people. Uh, it's, it's held by Advent Source, so some of you can just drive on over and pick it up if you want. Uh, it's only 120 miles from here, I think, 150, something like that. But you can order it online and, and so on. Um, in addition to that, uh, we did 24 hours of DVD. And this was done in Turkey and Greece. It was done in studio, so it's a really, you know, HD TV thing. 
Uh, Hope Channel is running it as a series. So if you've seen the Hope Channel series, it's called Revelation, Hope, Meaning, Purpose, then you have some idea of what it's about. Um, I suggest that people can use it three ways. You can use the videos to just give you ideas of how you want to preach the material. Or you can just show the DVDs and then lead a questions and answer afterward. Or you can write your own sermon but use clips, and that's, that's what I did when I did evangelism recently. I used clips from the series, and we'll, I'll show you how that works today, and along with uh, preaching and PowerPoints and so on. In addition to this, there's a presenter's resources DVD that has handbills, posters, PowerPoints, additional materials, illustrations, stories, evangelistic strategies, all kinds of stuff like that. Bradford was mostly responsible for that, but it's really good stuff. I went through all of it and, and you know, shaved the edges a little if it wasn't totally faithful to Scripture. You know, all that kind of stuff. So I, I think this has gone through the Biblical Research Committee, South Pacific Division. It is, uh, the general editor is the president of the South Pacific Division, so it's, it's definitely a church related product. It has been vetted by BRI at the General Conference. And there are 25 scholars that appear in these videos from Andrews University, from the General Conference, from Loma Linda, from Avondale, around the world, all different kinds of scholars. So uh, there's probably no evangelistic project that's ever been more seriously vetted by the church uh, than this one. Is it perfect? <coughs> uh, don't even begin to claim that it's perfect. But uh, it is uh, certainly an effort, I think, that was worth doing. And it's an option for your evangelistic uh, programs. So I thought uh, my pastor challenged me. Why don't we do a series here in Calamesa, Calamesa Church, a church of about 1,400 members. And uh, it's a church that's felt kind of burned by evangelism in the past. And uh, a lot of members were not too excited about it. So I said, let me preach a sermon about three weeks before. And I'll t this is how I started it. So we're starting public meetings on October 26. Does that make you excited or depressed? In my experience, the unspoken question of the day when evangelism comes to an Adventist church is, is it safe? to bring my relatives to these meetings? <laughs> Will I lose my friends if I bring them? Will they feel shamed, blamed, or coerced into something they don't want to do? Not all members are thinking that way, but many are. I'm not suggesting that evangelism is always scary or unpleasant, but we've probably all had experiences we'd like to avoid in the future. So let's take this issue head on right here. I want to talk about the basic goal and strategy of the series. I want you to know that it's safe to bring your family and friends, and I want you to know that you will enjoy seeing them as well. So here's the strategy we did. It doesn't have to be your strategy. But we wanted to reach Calamesa community. I mean, here you've got a church, about 1,250 members. Calamesa's got 8,000 people. <coughs> So, it's kind of evangelized already. <laughs> Maybe not. I noticed that not many people walk to church, so the neighborhood, at least, is still open. <laughs> they know the church is there, but they're not, you know, not going to show up. Uh, all right. So, how can we set a venue that will seem normal to people who are not used to church? So, we called it Calamesa University. And we took the format of a community college class. And that was that we were going to meet on a couple of Tuesday nights a month, second and fourth Tuesdays every month. Part of that was because of my schedule. I'm away so much doing stuff like this that I couldn't just, you know, do six weeks or whatever. Anyway, so we said, well, let's do it like a community college class. We'll start in September, and we'll run it through to the spring. Then we'll take a break over the summer, and then we'll run it through the second year. So it's like... Uh, like a course. Now in California, uh, community college classes cost $30, so we charge $30. So this is a class. All right. 
And that more than covers these materials. I think they're $12, something like that. So, you know, they're getting materials, et cetera, everything for that. Um, decided not to advertise the traditional way. So we didn't spend a cent on advertising, except posted posters and stores around the community and uh, created a website and, and did some advertising on the internet. Asked the people to register in advance. And uh, 234 people paid the 30 bucks and registered in advance. And the first night, we had 15 walk-ins from the community. People who just walked in from the neighborhood to see what was going on. Did put a banner out uh, in front of the church. And uh, we didn't lose it. Did or didn't? Did. There was a banner out. There was posters in the stores. So yeah, probably there was you know $100 expense or something. Very little advertising. But uh, uh, the key, though, after that sermon, there was a long line waiting to talk to me and a long line waiting to talk to the senior pastor. And basically, just what people were saying was, now that I know what the meetings are about, I wasn't going to come, but now I want to come. But I have a question. Would it be okay to invite my neighbor or my relative? That's what the question they were asking. What was it that I told them? What is there about this series that changed the dynamic within the church toward evangelism? That's what I want to share with you. Will it work? Uh, we have some significant issues. That was just an idea. You know, the Calamese University and stuff. And, and we can talk about that if we have time. But you don't know if you don't try. And the point is trying some way that breaks the barrier to where people say, this is not so strange anymore. This is something I actually want to see. This, this might be interesting and see who God will bring. So let me show the opening clip, the very beginning of the series. It's about six minutes, and uh, we got the sound ready here. And then uh, be interested in what you think of it. Apocalypse, the 
book of Revelation is an apocalypse talking about big themes uh, using this as symbols, animals, and, uh, and similar things. It's quite amazing. It seems like all through the centuries, every generation has found hope, meaning, and purpose from this book. Well, some people feel that it's that the book itself was actually prophetic, that God placed uh, in a man's mind some sense of what the world would be like today. That's, that's an amazing reason why, Yeah, that's why amazing people, I think, are interested uh, in the book today. Great, yeah. Well, why don't you take us on a little tour? Where, where did it happen? All right. Back in the first century AD, the Roman Empire, we have this little island of Patmos off the coast of what we would call Turkey, Asia Minor, and John was writing this book, this prophetic book, we believe, to these seven churches in the first century. The Roman Empire dominated the whole scene, and John was probably a victim of that Roman Empire. Mm. All right. Well, uh, why don't we take a visit to the island of Patmos, uh, where John was, and uh, show everyone uh, what that was like. Well, John, take us on a tour. Okay, let's All do right. it. Let's have a look. Welcome to our tour of the island of Patmos, the place where John wrote the book of Revelation. Behind me, you can see the beautiful harbor of the island. It's very windy up here at the moment, and we've come through some rough seas to get here. But we also know that life can be rough as well. And we believe this series will help to give hope, meaning, and purpose to your life. We're standing here at the entrance to the cave where, according to tradition, Jesus appeared to John, the revelator who passed it on to us. And we've also found out that these three stones here are to represent the Trinity, the Holy Trinity. And right back here we have the altar where it is claimed the very revelation itself took place. We're inside the Monastery of St. John, which sits magnificently on top of the highest point in the island of Patmos. I'm in front of the chapel, which is a very beautiful place, and uh, the entire monastery here has been placed in honor of the revelation that took place on this island. There is abundant ancient evidence that John was here on the island of Patmos as an exile. Uh, imprisoned because of his preaching of the gospel. But frankly, the island of Patmos looks like anything but a prison. You have the beautiful blue waters. You have the different shade of blue in the sky. You have the brown and the green of the hills. You often have the white, the bright white of the whitewashed houses that are done in that way to keep the summer's heat out of the interior. Uh, the island of Patmos is a magnificent, almost a magical place. Perhaps no more glorious place uh, would be appropriate for this revelation of Jesus Christ and of the heavenly world to which he calls us. John, but isn't it also true that over the centuries this book has caused a lot of trouble? All right, what did you notice there that's a little different? Dialoguing. Yeah. Okay, dialoguing rather than preaching. Right. What did you notice in the dialogue? You're not speaking like you know it all. It's not an absolute truth. You've spoken in a way that allows for a secular person to listen in and go, hmm, never thought of it that way. Versus just telling him, this is what it is. You're opening the idea that. Well, uh, what, I, what people have come to understand. Some people think, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's very important insight uh, because uh, with, with the today's generation, particularly the postmodern generation, the more confident you are that you know the truth, the less trust they have in you. Mm -hmm. it, it's actually the reverse of the previous generation where an evangelist had to have a lot of confidence in order to carry the people along. Uh, the younger generation has seen that confidence in people like Osama bin Laden, uh, people like Saddam Hussein, uh, you know, uh, th that people use that confidence uh, to gain power over other people. So that's a feature we, we sought along the way to allow some openness. And there's one place uh, in there where I'm challenged with a question regarding to whether the seven trumpets uh, made me a better person or not in my studies. And my response was, I'm not sure that it has, which is a truthful response. But 
Typically, in the past, I would have been defensive at that point. Well, yeah, you know, really, but, you know, you, you say something to try to get out of the, the thing, but to simply say, no, there's stuff I don't know. And that actually enhances credibility with uh, particularly people under 40 uh, on the whole. Anyone else notice anything? You used a historical approach. Historical approach, yeah. Theological approach and also historical you know how excited people are about Mayan calendars? I never even heard of those until five years ago. <laughs> you see, so that's plugging in a little something. You know, these icons and all this stuff does, does connect with people. Do you notice the bantering? Actually, as we go through Patmos and other places, we're constantly playing tricks on each other. Uh, he loses his car keys in Ephesus, and I got to go down in the ancient toilet to recover them, you know, things like that. And, uh, you know, that. that and that becomes a, an issue between us as we go along. So we're, we're, we're being real people. In, in real life, I mean, I, I know you guys. When you're on your own together, you're laughing your heads off half the time, right? You're having a good time together. And so, so we want people to see this. Normal people can get into the book of Revelation and find hope, meaning, and purpose. That's another piece, the positive. Uh, often revelation is shared all the terrible things that are going to happen we've chosen instead to emphasize the positive there's hope here there's meaning there's purpose your life can be improved by studying this book yeah I think the other thing that strikes me is it's very casual mm -hmm. so as to you know typical evangelism everybody's dressed in suit and tie including the greeters and so on and so forth this is more of a like you said kind of a classroom setting where it's basically we're here more so to basically come to something together as opposed to we're here to tell you something, which I think is different. And we're not saying this is better than other forms of evangelism, but I, I think if we simply did what everyone else did, we, we you know, I, I can't do as good as Finley does, so why try to copy him? Uh, rather do something that he doesn't do or can't do and uh, give you an alternative uh, to try with people. Yeah. I, both of you, your, your approach considering your age is, is really fantastic because if you turn on the TV Sunday morning and look at all the religious channels, all the old guys that are on there from their various religious persuasions, they are coming across as, their, as the big authorities and you know, uh, you know that authoritarian approach that does prohibit, uh, I, I believe in myself included, the younger people from tuning in. I'm, I'm, you know, and so you guys having that casual approach and, and have, you know, that really, to me, does make a difference. Well, what, what affirmed me more than anything else was when we got the first clip from, uh, from Hope Channel. Uh, it was a one-hour piece. It wasn't this one. It was a different one. But when it was done, my son was excited about it. He's 26. And showing any interest in anything besides the Internet is kind of hard for him. So that was very affirming that, you know, boy, this is interesting. I want to watch more of these. And, and, and getting that reaction from young women. They particularly like the pranks and stuff. You see, you know, just by surprise, you know, right in the middle of a, of a speech at Laodicea, we delivered a glass of water and it tastes disgusting, and I spit it out on his feet, you know. <laughs> and, you know little things that, so that the young people are watching for that stuff, and they, uh, they, they find it, it heightens the interest. Um, there's five key principles that guided us in doing this series that are different from traditional evangelistic series. Just so you're fully aware, uh, as you consider this as an option for the future, uh, to know uh, how we're going about it. First of all, it's an exegetical approach. In other words, we go chapter by chapter, <coughs> verse by verse, through the book, telling the story of the book. We deal with doctrines as they appear in the book rather than jump to them uh, somewhere else. I did not expect this, but in Calamesa that was huge. People deeply resented the idea that people are jumping all over the Bible and when they're done, you have no idea how to duplicate their work. And our hope is that when we're done, somebody can take that chapter and draw the main ideas out and actually uh, use it. A lot of our lay people are discouraged because they don't understand how we came to these conclusions. My mom was a member for 75 years, never understood how to give a Bible study. She believed these things, but she didn't understand how we got there. It was confusing to her. And, and so we've chosen to take 
a chapter by chapter approach that the doctrines would arise out of the text itself that uh, for example in the book of Revelation it often alludes to the Old Testament there's your cue gotta go to Daniel here and now you can talk a little bit about Daniel so you're going to other parts of the Bible where the book itself points you that way and I, I think that that uh, develops a, a certain credibility um, scholars have discovered that Revelation 1 1 has a powerful allusion to Daniel 2 great timing you, know, you knew Daniel too. Uh, also established the idea of historicism, you know, that, that, that this is about certain big moves in history and, and the connection between Revelation and Daniel. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Pauling, you'll probably be getting to this uh, question, but um, you're introducing uh, this series to us. Are you, are you, you and him both the main, I mean, like, I would be a facilitator or somebody else in my church would be the facilitator. What is our mm -hmm. role just to show these videos and then ask questions? That's or, one possibility. Uh -huh. One possibility is you just show the 53 minutes, whatever it is. It's around 51, 53 commercials and stuff, you know. So show the 50 plus minutes, have a discussion, hand out the materials. You can review the videos yourself, do your own service. Or you can do your own sermons and use clips, which like I'm doing here, I'm talking to you, but then occasionally we'll look at a clip. Uh, so yeah, any of those three would work fine. Yeah. So uh, I think it's important that you be the key people, person because you're the one in the end that's going to walk them through their spiritual journey. So uh, that the focus not be so much on us, but be more on you, I think is important. So I would recommend, and again, if a person, if you got a lay person that says, I could never preach, they can still show the video. So, that's, so that does give people options, yeah. And one more question as far as filling out the material in the booklet. So when do you do that? Obviously probably afterwards or, or do, you, yeah. do you tell people this is homework? Or it's what? completely up to you. If there's a real flaw in this series is that we gave you so much material that a person has to spend some time deciding what am I going to use, what am I not going to use, and organizing it. So uh, some people said we wish it had just been nice and simple and we just do it. But I, I didn't want to give a rote thing that's done the same everywhere in the world. I wanted people to know way more than what they were teaching. And for each of these, uh, for each of these folders, there's electronic stuff that's two or three times as long, more material so that you know a lot more of the people. You can go through these with them at the beginning of each meeting and then show clips and so lots of ways you can do it and there's an evangelistic strategy that that gives you those options. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Bali, do you have a transcript that we could use, you know, for our own notes? Like you're saying, watch the video. And of the video. Or the material that you have transcripts. You know, I know that a transcript exists because they needed it to translate into Chinese. But I, that, that's a thought. We should put the transcript on, the, on a presenter's resource. Let me, let me write that down. <laughs> Good suggestion. Uh, yeah, I like that idea. We have transcript for translation. It's, it's now in about six languages, I think. Uh, Serbo-Croatian was the most uh, recent one they got really excited about. Um, let me share with you, I mentioned 25 scholars. And what's cool about it is we have scholars from five different continents. Four of them are women. Uh, we got all different shapes and colors and, and so on. And uh, I think, so people can relate to these scholars uh, in that way. Let me... Uh, oh, come on. There we go, okay. Let me, uh, there it is, got it, okay, uh, I want to show you one of our scholars, he's from the Biblical Research Institute at the General Conference, and this, this is a slam dunk, I gave the guy two minutes to summarize the reliability of Bible prophecy, everything's got to be clipped, you know, watch what he does. I think this is amazing. I've watched it 15 times and every time it's better. The issue at stake here has to do with the reliability of biblical prophecy. And in particular, we are concerned about the predictive aspects of prophecy. 
Whenever I am confronted with this question, I ask myself, why is there an issue at all when the Bible clearly states that God is able to tell the future? The problem is that those who argue against the reliability of prophecy have three arguments. One, that all things should be explained naturally. Two, that God does not communicate with humans directly. And three, even if he does, he cannot speak with us in words. These are all intellectual commitments that these people have made and which do not come from scripture. So if you have a personal belief in a personal God, then you have no problem with predicting prophecy at all. On my part, I believe in predicted prophecy for three reasons. Number one, that the arguments against them are really not solid. Number two, when you think about the prophets and the risks that they had to go through, they must either have been delusional or they truly believe that God had communicated to them. Number three is the high degree of fulfillment that these prophecies have obtained. And I believe that when you take all these things together, we can depend on biblical prophecy. Isn't that amazing? Two minutes straight. Yeah. So uh, we've got at least 50 clips like that in the course of the series uh, from the top people in the world in, in, many, uh, in many cases. So uh, that, that's an exciting piece of it. So one thing, one feature which is unique is an exegetical approach going chapter by chapter. And the younger generation is into narrative. They want to know the story. And if you don't tell them the story, if it doesn't arise out of the story, then they get confused and they tend to lose interest. So we try to stay with the story of the book and bring out the teachings uh, at, the, at the crucial times. And of the fundamental beliefs, we thoroughly cover 16 of the 28 in the course of this series. And you say, well, why don't you cover them all? Well, simply because doing that effectively is, you know, it's just too much to cover in that period. But you all have Bible classes, you know, baptismal classes that follow, and there are hints to all of them, but you can use those baptismal classes to, uh, to follow up with the things that are not covered here. But we cover those things that come out of the book of Revelation uh, itself and out of its connections with other parts of the Bible. Number two, I think you look at any series and it focuses on some fundamentals better than others. So that, that shouldn't be uh, too big of a surprise. Number two, a second key principle <coughs> is that this, me, this series be more Christ-centered than has been typical. To try to find Jesus at every point, even in the seven trumpets. And uh, I think in plain language of the beginning, he says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the revelation of Middle Eastern oil or the revelation of Babylon. Uh, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. The seminar, the seminar is not so much about communicating information as communicating relationship with the one who revealed it and is revealed in it. So building a relationship of trust in prophecy in Jesus Christ is a crucial element that we focused on in developing this series. Number three, we wanted it to be more gospel-oriented than typical situations. We wanted uh, the getting right with God to be critical. There was a time when most of our audiences were Protestants. And we could assume certain basics of Christianity there. Those days are largely gone in most parts of the United States, particularly in Europe and Australia. And so building a strong foundation in the gospel and, and basic relationship with Jesus, I think, uh, we felt was, was very, very critical. Number four, we wanted this series to be more practical, more everyday life oriented. But that's not easy always with the book of Revelation. <coughs> because uh, the book of Revelation speaks of grand themes and history and so on. But we sought to focus at every stage to be practical, to, to have value on Monday morning at the job, 
And so we added a third person to the team. You haven't seen that person yet. But it's a third person that bursts onto the scene as a surprise. And is the person that does that in every program and asks the questions that they don't answer in seminary. You know, the kind of everyday questions. Somebody with a bachelor's degree, somebody without the scholarly credentials who comes in and challenges the scholarship to be real and be practical. And you'll get to see uh, how that happens. So we include in here material on stages of faith and recovery and boundaries and things like that, where they connect with what's going on in the book of Revelation. For example, what's one of the chief features of the original audience of Revelation? Persecution. What is the challenge in persecution? It comes at the issue of rejection. You're being rejected by your family, by your society. How do you handle that? How does rejection affect people in their lives? How do they overcome it? You see, so you can go from the big picture in Revelation and talk about practical issues if you have somebody who's focused on that and not so much on the other thing. So let me share with you the last clip, and this will be a longer one. It will begin in Ephesus and walking through private homes that have recently been unearthed in Ephesus and talking about what it would be like to have been a Christian living in that neighborhood. Uh, then... The third person bursts in when Graham gets a little too full of himself, and uh, you'll see what happens after that. Let me see if we can set that up. Yeah, it's not wanting to cooperate, so let me go at it a different way. Sorry. One thing you can do is put this right into your PowerPoint or something like that, and, and that way it'll flow a little smoother. In Cala Mesa, we had specialists who had this all set up ahead of time. Okay, here we go. Welcome back. Uh, would you like to see how people in John's day used to live? Uh, we have some big shots of some of the homes in ancient Ephesus. Let's have a look. Okay. I'm standing in the terrace houses of ancient Ephesus. Uh, these are largely constructed one or two hundred years uh, before the time when the book of Revelation was written and would have been a major feature of this part of the city at that time. In the ancient Roman world, there were two main types of houses for the wealthy. Uh, one type was called the domus, and the other was the insula. The domus would be like a private home with a big central courtyard. The insula was sort of like an ancient condominium uh, where a number of families uh, would all construct their houses in an apartment complex. And uh, this is one of those. This is an insula type apartment. Now let's imagine that we have uh, a Christian. Let's call him Jason. And he's a Christian Jew. And he's living here uh, in one of these apartments uh, in Ephesus. How would persecution be faced by such a Christian? What would the dynamic be? When you look at the historical records, and even the record in the book of Revelation, there's not a lot of evidence that Christians were systematically persecuted at this time. Acts of persecution occurred, but there was no empire-wide, systemic uh, sense of persecution at the time. Uh, the reality is that most persecution would have occurred at a local level. Perhaps something like this. Let's say Jason is living down here, and on one side uh, is a Jewish neighbor, on the other side is a pagan neighbor. Christians often were sheltered in the fact that Romans saw them as Jews, part of the Jewish faith. And Jews had freedom to practice their religion without worshiping the emperor or doing the civic holidays and so forth. But let's say this neighbor here doesn't get along so well with the neighbors on each side, and maybe his goats get out of the pen now and then and eat up the petunias uh, in front of the neighbor's house. And, and finally this Jewish neighbor just has had enough, and he says, I'm going to go to the authorities and let them know. He's no Jew. 
you see? And then, when this Christian is brought in, when Jason is brought in, and is challenged in these things, then they say to him, well, if you're not a Jew, what are you? That means you need to worship the emperor. And uh, let's find out if you're actually a true believer in Rome. And so local persecution means that it has more to do with how Christians get along with their neighbors than any governmental attempt uh, to stop Christianity. And so for a Christian, whether or not to participate in the festivities of his neighbors is a serious issue because if you are seen as antisocial, if you don't get along, a neighbor could very easily have you turned in and you'd face imprisonment or even death. Boy, there was a lot of pressure on people of faith back then. How, how do you suppose they well, coped with that? Well, people can cope if they know that God is in control and he's caring for them and he's promised to put his arms of love around to protect them. Of course you can cope if you know that God... What? What do you mean God is always in control? He's always caring, always love. What about all the children John, who what, go... What's going on? Uh, <laughs> this is, is your wife, Pamela. <laughs> She's my wife, and uh, we've been together about that. 35 uh, years. And uh, one thing I've always appreciated about Pamela is that she asks the questions that scholars didn't hear the answers to when they were in school. I'm sorry if I upset her. I mean, yeah, I mean, God is around, and He does promise to care for us and protect us and look after us. And but I want to know. What about all the children who go to sleep at night because they don't have enough to eat, because they've been abused? I know a little bit about that, going to sleep at night because there is physical and emotional abuse. What about the women who've been raped and uh, been abused? And, and what about all those You're women asking and some the children? Tough questions there. You're asking Do you have some tough questions? Questions? I think, Graham, I think the key here is this. When you say that God is in control, uh, it then raises the question, well, where was he? Yeah. When, when right. things happen okay. to people, well, where was he? I think the key here is the issue of trust. Yeah. You see, if you trust God, and if you know he's in control, the combination of those two, I think, is what gives people oh, confidence. I only plead to Pamela, he was through. Because the next session, we're going to show that God is not way out there. He's right here. And then the session after, we're going to see the big picture. So just hear us through, won't you? Okay. And uh, we hope that was a fun way to welcome Pamela <laughs> into our program. <laughs> Interesting to see how she handles us in the our material. Okay. Let's go to break. He's just a little bit shaken still from uh, what just occurred. And uh, I'd like to reflect a little bit uh, with you, Pamela, because we were talking about persecution, what it was like for the ancient Christians. And, and by the way, people should know, uh, you and I have had conversations like this uh, through the years, and scholars often can be off in their own world, but I appreciate the common touch that uh, you're going to be bringing to our I programs, yeah. uh, I think, tremendously. And it seems to me that when somebody is living in the ancient Roman world, he's a neighbor in that world, uh, the big issue is how you deal with your neighbors, how you deal with the social life. And uh, I think a crucial aspect of that is rejection. Uh, people, when they feel like they're different, uh, they can often feel rejection and so on. And, and, and Christians, as they were dealing with that rejection, uh, had to find ways uh, to cope with it. Was there ever a time in your experience when you really feel uh, felt rejection? Yeah, I think uh, there definitely was. And uh, as I recall, through the years, uh, rejection is what I really felt. It was uh, when my parents divorced. I was only 12 years old at the time. Um, there's five children in my family. And I remember the day like it was yesterday uh, when my parents divorced. And um, the day that that divorce was final, um, I remember my parents came home from the lawyer and uh, my mom came home into the house. My dad stayed away 
but my mom came home with, um, she came into the house with the suitcases and boxes, and her job then was to pack everything up that she owned and uh, leave. And so the five of us kids watched. And uh, my, my youngest brother was two years old, and then the rest of us were like eight, nine, uh, 12, and 13. And uh, so she brought her suitcases and boxes, like I said, into the house. And she packed her clothes from her room. And then boxes uh, and packed. I remember she went into the kitchen and took the Tupperware. She had been a Tupperware dealer, so she had lots of that. And packed that in boxes. And then just took enough of whatever she needed from the kitchen. Uh, silverware and plates and pots and pans. I remember you saying she was even dividing up the family pictures. Yeah, you know, she pulled out the picture drawer. How and, did you feel at that moment? Well, you know, it was quite a devastating thing, you know. There were the family pictures and she had to decide, well, half of them would stay and half of them she would, she would take with her. And, you know, my oldest sister or I were holding the baby and while he was sucking on his pacifier and in diapers and you know here we were had to watch this scene before us and as she's packing and things away as you were watching did you somehow feel responsible for this well i think children often often think well what could i have done differently maybe if i would have been a better child then maybe the parents would have stayed together maybe i had something to do with my parents um, divorcing. I think often people, uh, children, do take responsibility for these things. It's as if, if I had been a better child, then maybe this wouldn't have happened, and so forth. And I, I know from experience that in many ways this has marked Pamela's life. And, and uh, even to this day at times, uh, she can tear up in, in telling this story. You're probably wondering, what does this have to do with the book of Revelation? The book of Revelation speaks to people who have felt rejection people who have suffered. Now let me share with you Revelation chapter 1 and parts of verses 5 and 6. It says, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. You know, I recognize that sometimes God can seem distant at times like this, difficult. But when you come to understand over time, and over the next couple of sessions, uh, uh, we're going to try to do that, to come to discover that God really cares deeply, to come to discover that God hurts with us when we hurt, and he has made us kings and priests. That means to the rejected ones, they feel cast down. They feel like they're not worth anything. And to them, God says, I'm raising you up to the highest imaginable status in this world. And as we come, begin to think in those terms, we can begin to deal with the rejection that I think all of us have experienced uh, in one way or another. Graham? I agree, John, and I've been really moved by Pamela and what she has said. And I'm sure there are many who've been watching this program who, who feel identified with Pamela. It was a moving experience, and there are others out there who've gone through similar experiences, not exactly the same, but some may have felt rejected. Uh, some have been abandoned by their parents and some are out there, as Pamela has said, are hungry. Some out there are very, very lonely. And we want to encourage you that this book of Revelation does give you hope and meaning and purpose. You find your, your identity by understanding that God is there. He is in control of your life and of history. And we want to make this very clear throughout this whole series. And we want to thank you also for watching Hope Channel and watching this program of Revelation, Hope, Meaning and Purpose. Our very next session coming up is going to deal with how God has been involved in our lives, in our history. Right from chapter 1 we're going to see he has not been way out there as a bystander watching. He's come down here in a very meaningful way to build hope, meaning and purpose in your life and my life. Thank you once again for watching and we look forward to being with you again in the very next program.
All right, we need to draw this to a close, but I think you get an idea of the direction that we have, uh, have gone with the program in attempting to affect the practical, everyday aspect. There's one more thing I want to share with you, the fifth one, and this was also critical for Calamasa Church to get on board, and that is we have chosen to take a more positive view toward other faiths. In other words, rather than emphasizing the ways in which we are different from everyone else, uh, rather to use the challenges in Scripture, to use the uh, you know, mark of the beast and things like that, to address our own vulnerability and a teachable type of spirit. Uh, as we look at, uh, for example, as we look at history, some of the great historians today, that notice how the church went downhill. And Bart Ehrman is not even a Christian. And yet he indicates Christianity lost significant things in those early centuries, things that it has never recovered. It's never been quite the same. And, and so it raises the interesting question, if this papalization of the church was a disaster, why did God allow it to happen? Ehrman points out there's five or six versions of Christianity in the early church, and under Constantine, most got crushed, and only one survived. Why? If God is ruling history, why did the papacy win? And the interesting answer is this, because they got the most important thing right. What was that? The canon of the New Testament. With the New Testament, Reformation can happen. With the canon of Scripture right, God can fix things. If any of the other versions of early Christianity, like the Marcionites, the, the Gnostics, uh, the monastics and so on, if their version of Scripture had become the norm, the Bible would be a very different book. So I see a God who in mercy allowed the papacy to win in order that ultimately his vision could be accomplished. Now that, that's a different approach. It's not pointing fingers, but it's saying, hey, God's in control even when things are a mess. And even when things are going down the tubes, if we allow it, God can still bring something good out of it. The implication, of course, is that even we, Graham and I, don't have everything right. Uh, if you ask the question, who's closer to God? Uh, you know, would, am I closer to a two-year-old or to God in my knowledge of eternal things? And what's the obvious answer, even if you don't want to say it? Two I'm much closer to a two-year-old, you see. If that's the case, then even in Scripture, God is talking to two-year-olds. There's that big a gap. And so humility, vulnerability, uh, teachable spirit are things that... Uh, you know, we want very much to illustrate in here, and I think that are very, very crucial to the new generation. The Jews, the Romans, the papacy at their worst are illustrations of what not to do. They're not there so we can be prejudiced against their descendants. They're there as lessons for us. And, and that's how we have chosen it. And that was huge in Calamasa. People said, if you were going to be bashing other people, we're not going to be there. We're definitely not bringing our neighbors. So uh, it's very, very important as we think about things evangelistically to know the audience that we're speaking to. I'm not saying this is the best way or the only way. I'm simply saying we have deliberately chosen a different approach so that uh, it will be effective, particularly in Australia, this was felt to be the right approach to go uh, by the church leadership. South America, has taken a similar approach through the years with a tremendous amount of success. Obviously in South America, everybody almost is Catholic. So if you take a negative approach there, you do more harm than good. But the purpose of the papacy stuff was when America was a Protestant nation. It's basically challenging the Protestants. You don't like these guys, and why are you like them? Why, why are you letting them tell you what to do? It was great evangelistic strategy. If that's working where you are, by all means. But it's an evangelistic strategy. And uh, so we're offering a, uh, a uh, approach 
that is a little more positive toward other faiths. It brings out the challenges, but it recognizes that uh, uh, that people of other faiths do have a connection with God. There are many Catholics who are right with God, who will be, who will be in the fold at the end of time. Uh, I think Ellen White says the vast majority of God's people are still in other faiths. So uh, recognizing that uh, positive side uh, is very attractive to many people in today's world. So, by the way, Graham is awesome with conclusions. I think you know, the way he brings everything together in, the, in appeal at the end uh, is done very, very well. So finally, the three selling points uh, here is, first of all, it's the most heavily vetted series ever. It's gone through uh, South Pacific Division General Conference. Uh, these 25 scholars from different parts have all been involved in the project. So I don't think there's ever been a series that's had more eyes on it more cautions expressed, more uh, challenges, etc. Um, second, I think it's an attempt to heal the divide between scholars and evangelists. Yeah. They've often been in two different places in the church, and to be able to be together on this and to, and to be, have a burden for souls together, that was exciting. And I, I learned a lot from doing it. I think Graham learned a lot too. You notice how he was trying to fix my wife? You know, so at that point, that's, it, that's the evangelist. You know, okay, she raised the question. Bam, let me answer. That's not what she needed at that moment. You know, so, and so I kind of stepped in a little bit of that, and other times he stepped in to stop me when that needed to happen. So it was a great partnership. And finally, it's, it's a new paradigm. And uh, I, uh, those who feel uh, light in it, I encourage you to consider uh, how you might uh, use it. Uh, where do you get this stuff from Advent Source, which is uh, based at the, your union here. So uh, Mid-America Union will be the center point from which uh, this will be available throughout the division. So that would be the place to go, their website and all that. Yeah. The, uh, the handouts that have been passed through here, uh, they all come in a set? They don't come separately? They can come separately. They can. Yeah. If Advent Source <coughs> doesn't have them separately, you can get those from South Pacific. Uh, you know, in large bulk orders, the shipping is not such a big deal. But they, they've done really well with the pricing. I think the videos were only like $45, $50 for 24 hours uh, of stuff. And the whole pastor's package is less than 100 And then if you anticipate 100 people coming, you'd get 100 sets of the printed materials. So. How many videos are there? How many what? Videos? 24. 24 50 minute uh, videos. So it's a series of 24. In the South Pacific, they also have a series of 12 and a series of 5. Does it cover the yeah. entire book of Revelation? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The series of 12 uh, covers the entire book, but more briefly, for those who like a shorter series, and there's a series of 5 that one can use as a weekend as an introduction to uh, get people into the longer series. But Advent Sources at this point has the 24. Yeah. All right, well, I think I need to let you get some lunch. One more question. When you did the series, how many nights did you meet or something? We met a total of 26 nights. Uh, and a couple of things we learned, some things that didn't go well. First of all, I think that was too long. I would definitely, uh, doing it again, keep it within like a nine month period. I think going over two years. It, it was just a little bit too long and too scattered. So that's one thing. We thought we'd give it a try. Uh, the other thing that didn't go well is uh, the first night they took these packets and gave them to the people. And so we ended up not being able to keep track of people very well, and that, that, that was not good. We had several baptisms, but it was not, not what I would have hoped. Uh, we had, I think, 70, 75 visitors uh, the first night. And it would have been, the, the beauty of these things is it's, they want the whole series. If you give them one at a time, they're going to come back. If they right. don't come, it gives you an excuse to drop by the door and say, hey, mm -hmm. you know, uh, things happen, people get busy. We wanted to make sure that you had the material. And uh, the next one is going to be Tuesday night. Um, so we didn't have uh, that opportunity. So that was a, that was a major blunder, uh, I think, that occurred and uh, that, that we would do differently next time. We are talking to the pastors of Loma Linda University Church about doing this 
uh, there on the campus uh, and calling it a legacy of prophecy. Because in the healthcare setting, uh, the whole issue of apocalyptic and prophecy is challenging. And a lot of people, uh, there's a church called The Rock, which is made up largely of ex-adventists. It's kind of like Willow Creek. It was of thousands of members and stuff. So uh, we're, we're working on that. But the, the venue that it's supposed to happen in needs to be built, and they're having some problems with it. So we've held off for a little bit. But want to want to keep... Uh, keep uh, working with it. And Graham would come over for that and do it live. So that sounded exciting. Yeah? Um, the pastor's pack you're going to make available to us at a special discount, is that? Uh, Advent source, yeah. I don't, I'm not here to make money or to sell it. I'm simply letting you be aware of uh, materials that are available. But uh, I will mention there was one conference in North America that uh, uh, it's not to embarrass anyone, uh, I'll, I'll leave that. So they had like 100 evangelistic meetings. 99 of them were traditional ones. Uh, one pastor chose to use this series. Uh, he baptized 34, none of the others had double digits. So it has, uh, I think, in the right hands, it, it, it has some uh, powerful things. In Australia, uh, there was one pastor who uh, announced to his neighbors that he was going to show these videos uh, every Tuesday night in his driveway. Oh. Set up a screen against the garage, show them the driveway. People wandering by, just stop for a minute, for an hour, whatever you want. His neighbors right next door came every night and they were baptized. Amen. And that was cool. And like I said, this is something members can use. They just show the videos and take questions. You know, uh, it's very easy and simple. Um, another pastor in Australia did the series and an attendee was a Baptist pastor. I met the Baptist pastor. And when it was done, the pastor says, you need to do this series in my church. He says, yeah, but they would, they'll make Adventists out of the people. He says, I don't care because they need this material. He says, I want my people to have it. And so uh, he's doing the series in the Baptist church. So it's, it's done, as, you see, when you don't burn the bridges, Sometimes people will say, well, that's exactly what we need. Yeah, so. All right. Yeah? Can you expand on the differences between the larger series and what you've done to narrow the 12 to 9? Yeah. In the, in the series of 12, it basically does two of these together. And I'm not super excited about that because I think, if anything, with 24 is still not enough to cover everything that's there. And uh, I would slim it down even further for the 24. So I'm not as enthusiastic as Graham is about the 12. Uh, but for those, the 24 is just too big for where you are. Uh, that is an option to consider. Has it got a certain name to it? I think it's the same, the same looking materials and so on. It's just uh, he's redivided everything to fit. He's cut out things so that it will fit into it. A series of twelve. No, I think they, they tend. Longer, huh? Uh, longer no, no, no. They're just the same. You know, like an hour, hour, hour and a half. They really condense the two. Condensing it. One. Yeah, dropping a lot of material. And uh, I think uh, you know the twenty-four is too short in many ways to cover everything. So you you want to have baptismal class or follow-up uh, almost regardless of so what we, you do. We would have to ask for the twelve <coughs> set. I don't think Advent Source has the 12 or the 5. But for that, you'd go to the website. I think it's revelationhope.com or .org. Is it .com? Okay, Revelation. Oh, it's right on the screen or something. Revelationhope.com is the Australian website, and, and they would have the 12 and the 5 if you want to uh, look at that. And the main issue there would be shipping from there, but if you're patient, uh, there are fairly cheap ways to do that. Yeah. How do you get your decisions then from these people? They just, they just come and ask you, or you went to their home, or what did you do? When I've uh, dealt with secular people in the past, I've always felt that they need more time. It's, it's a huge jump. If, if somebody's a Baptist, becoming an Adventist is something you can conceive in three, four weeks. If a person's a secular person, you can baptize them in three or four weeks, but they're not an Adventist in a real sense, you know. 
And I think so for people like that, uh, I would have lots of follow-up programs, keep them coming, keep working in their homes, and uh, when the time is right. I, I had people, uh, as I was pastoring in New York City, I had people come for two years. And then one night they just come up to me and say, how do you become a member of this church anyway? Now they've been coming, but they just hadn't yet connected. And when they were ready, they would usually signal that in some way. And then I'd go to their home, bring baptismal vows, you know, work through all the teachings, say, what, what here is unclear to you? And then set a, a, a goal to accomplish that. So uh, in New York, uh, using those low-key type of means, uh, we, we baptized uh, about 15 a year. And that's, uh, I do know, I, I don't want to come across, you know, in an inappropriate way, but I do remember my conference president wept when I left. He says, uh, you know, I, I, I don't see anybody engaging the community in that way. What are we going to do now? So I... Uh, I felt that there was something here that, that was valuable by not pressuring people, but by letting them grow. It kind of relates to the other thing, letting them grow at God's pace. Uh, we had more solid results, people who were, who were really secure and, and, and solid in the faith. And it changes the atmosphere of the church. In four or five years of that, and the majority of the members you know, have this young vigor and, and some of the the crusty stuff twos, you know, just don't control things anymore. No. <coughs> Thank you.